All right, that's <clears throat> grandfather clock has now stopped uh, doing its thing. So it's 12 o'clock. I think there's just a uh, goth that uh, we're missing from the panel. Um, but I think uh, being 12 o'clock, we've got an hour, <clears throat> he will uh, come in. And so I think we can commence. Is that okay with the panel? Good, good. <clears throat> right. So uh, welcome everyone uh, to virtual um, webinar introducing the Green Flag Association and <clears throat> looking at making buildings COVID safer. I'm John Samuel, uh, Director of uh, SAFMA, and uh, we welcome on this panel from the uh, Green Flag Association, uh, Dr. Re Greg Q, who's an Occupational med Medicine Specialist, UCT. Um, we uh, will be joining us will be uh, Mr. Garth Hunter, is occup Occupational Hygienist, South African Institute for Occupational Hygiene. We've got um, Robert Randolph from, um, who's the CEO of Apex Interna Environmental, joining us from the, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> uh, from um, the Drakensberg, and Sean, Sean Chester, who's the CEO of the Green Flag Association. <coughs> and um, and uh, what SAFMA has done is looked at uh, COVID as an aerosol transmitted disease, and we're not specialists in, uh, in aerosol transmitted diseases, but uh, as facilities managers, what is the impact of a aerosol transmitted disease on facilities? And here we're looking at all facilities. <clears throat> so uh, in discussions with the Green Flag Association, we, uh, we've thought that putting a webinar together uh, to discuss aerosol transmission, ventilation, management of uh, air, management of ventilation to reduce the spread of COVID um, would, would, is, is important. So um, that's, that's what we've done. So the, the format will be uh, some presentations, some discussions, um, and then from there, questions from the floor um, coming in on the on the chat line and the question and answer line, and uh, what we will do is answer those where we can. Um, we take all questions. Usual story: uh, guarantee to take all questions. Can't guarantee necessarily to answer them all immediately. We will then post the answers on the web on our website, um, and um, if we end up with a with a topic that uh, needs to be taken further, then um, that will be the subject of another another webinar, which responds to <clears throat> the needs of the membership. I think this is an important webinar, and uh, thank uh, everyone for um, for participating. So, <coughs> so I think on that. <coughs> Uh, um, I think if we lead off, uh, Greg, would you like to um, lead off with um, the with talking to us about this um, this little bug that's not alive and no one can see that's caused such devastation uh, through 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 the world, uh, and then we'll we'll um, move on from there. Thank you, Greg. Thank you so much, John. Just a quick sound check. All good on the sound. Yes, it sounds good to me. And uh, the, the presenter view is coming through correctly, I trust. Thank you so much for the introduction of this opportunity. I'm going to uh, only present five uh, slides, uh, but I want to use this as, a, as a, an opportunity to set the stage for this, the, the subsequent speakers and try to shed some light on this term aerosols and transmission that's associated with it. So the first couple of slides will be just to address this confusion about what does this word droplet mean, droplet spread, airborne spread, aerosols, etc., and then briefly speak about what that implication is by way of transmission risk. Uh, this is a slide that I borrowed from Professor Lindsay Ma, who's probably one of the worldwide gurus in uh, aerosol science based in the States. Um, and she's reminded us, and I'm a medical practitioner, in fact, a public medicine specialist of, of sorts. Um, and we take perhaps one of the main 
blames for part of this confusion. If you look at this, the terms airborne aerosol droplet droplet nuclei that are on the screen here, I'm just going to get a pointer going uh, there. So these terms are commonly seen in the newspapers, commonly seen in, common, in, in general speak, uh, but where do they come from? What do they mean? This term airborne was essentially a clinically based term invented by us in public medicine, infectious disease medicine, essentially meaning that it refers to a highly contagious uh, illness such as measles, even tuberculosis, airborne spread, we used to call it. And uh, so you'd have wards in a hospital that are designed to avoid airborne spread, basically saying it's a very contagious illness and therefore you must take certain measures. The term aerosol was used only intermittently for certain circumstances like an aerosol generating procedure, such as an intubation, what have you, or working in an ICU, essentially talking about small droplets. And based on science uh, uh, research by this chap, Wells, way back in 1934, 1934, so you might ask yourself, well, surely we could have done better than wait, you know, relying on these, the science 1934, but that's the truth of it. Um, and uh, the term droplet meant that it was larger than, a, than the sort of smaller droplet that would float around and create a risk of measles or other contagious diseases. So droplet spread would be referred to as things like flu that would spread uh, with larger droplets. And they used this cutoff of five microns based on Wells research in 34. Uh, research papers would talk about these things, droplet nuclei. Now, some of the folks in this in the audience may have heard of droplet nuclei because I see sometimes HVAC systems uh, refer to droplet nuclei. It's really about the residual uh, droplet after most of it is evaporated. So it'll be a small droplet, something along the lines of airborne. And then this word particle, usually in, in our space, talks about a virus. Aerosol science, which has come to the fore now, <clears throat> Uh, but has been around a while and only is really becoming recognized uh, as a consequence of COVID. They're a science-based group. They're basically mechanical or chemical engineers or aerosol science engineers now. And they refer to all of these things through pure physics. If it's airborne, it means it's in the air. If it's an aerosol, it's a collection of solid and, and liquid particles. A droplet is a liquid particle and so on. So um, there has therefore been a little bit of confusion between these two parts and, and the, the job now is to try and avoid the confusion. So the terminology is generally distilling down to these two, aerosol and droplet. And an aerosol uh, really is not smaller than five uh, microns. It's probably at about 60 microns. And those of you who are dealing with uh, air filtration units, et cetera, et cetera, in your building, buildings and building management systems would would want to know about these sorts of cutoffs. Uh, and a droplet is actually probably larger than about 100 microns. Um, and these terms are the ones that are probably more commonly being used by everybody. And I'm going to try and uh, limit myself to that. So this picture then starts talking about aerosols and droplets. Here's a person's breathing zone. Um, and these breathing zones have been well studied now through new technologies like this Schlieren uh, mirror that can uh, you probably see uh, videos of this on the internet. There's a person breathing, there's a person talking. You see how the talking breathing zone or talking zone is longer than the breathing zone because of the velocity behind talking is higher than breathing. And studies now out there that have really had a look at this very carefully. And aerosols can remain suspended in the air for hours, typically around about, uh, um, I'm just going to reduce the size a little bit here. Droppers uh, of varying sizes are in this breathing zone, but the smaller ones, smaller ones, say less than 60 microns, stay in the air longer, travel further. And they're the ones important uh, from an air uh, ventilation system's point of view. The larger droplets with well, that cutoff of about 100 microns, as I mentioned, they tend to fall down to the floor very rapidly and they'll end up on surfaces uh, and rather than remaining there. And typically speaking, uh, produces larger droplets and breathing the smaller droplets. All the droplets lose volume uh, rapidly through evaporation. So even some of the larger ones will become small enough just through evaporation to remain suspended in the air. And that's important consideration. So a lot of lot more volume is going in the air than is actually landing on surfaces. Uh, and the last point I want to make here is that the ambient environment affects the travel distance of these aerosols. If there's air movement, such as a fan or an air con that's recirculating the air in that, in that dwelling or in that building, uh, obviously the travel distance increases. And if people just walk around, that swirling around effect of people moving will also increase the distance. These three scenarios, uh, library scenario, quiet 
person sitting there just breathing away, people in an office environment talking to each other, and then people in an, in an environment where there's loud talking or singing or shouting, create entirely different scenarios of transmission risk. If you look at these little orange dots, if you can see them, they represent little uh, respiratory droplets capable of infecting people. So sitting quietly, breathing by yourself in a library or in your office, it'll take a while before you start collecting a sufficient aerosol um, for it to be a concern. But the moment you start talking, your transmission or your generation of, of aerosol increases tenfold. If you start shouting and singing, 50-fold. So, of course, these are what we hear about where uh, super spreader events happen when you get people grouped together, particularly if they are shouting and singing. So the implications for transmission then. Um, as an infected person, breathing, speaking, or maybe even coughing, generating aerosols and large droplets, transmission requires the virus to land on a susceptible target here, eyes or respiratory tract. Transmission via large droplets relies on close-up interaction. You've really got to be close which means you have to be within the plume, what we call a plume risk, or even direct hit on the eyes. Of course, that requires, uh, you know, it's a very low probability of a direct hit. Transmission via aerosols, these little droplets, takes place both in close up and further away. So the plume risk right here and the room risk, which is the entire room, uh, is uh, relevant in terms of aerosols. There's a greater surface area in the lungs, reached by aerosols than the eyes or nose, which is what's reached by droplets. So these aerosol transmit, uh, sorry, these uh, transmission pathways then are dominantly, that's why I put a big arrow there, because of the, what I've just explained, uh, the surface area, the volume of airborne uh, um, droplets and, uh, and aerosol, the much more likely pathway for transmission is via aerosol and large droplet spraying. Some of these droplets land on surfaces. Okay, they're heavy enough to land on surfaces. Um, and now they become a risk of direct contact and indirect contact via what we call fomites. So transmission via fomites is the last version for a form of transmission I want to talk about, direct and indirect contact. But this is much more challenging for the virus. Firstly, it's got to survive that lying on that surface. Uh, insufficient dose, by the way, sufficient dose to cause infection. And then it's got to find its way from that surface all the way into your lungs, much lower transmission risk. And this has implications. So what about uh, the implications of transmission in a room? So in a closed space, our breathing results in the accumulation of aerosols and this transmission uh, increases with the viral dose. So increasing trans concentration and time increases dose. So yeah, we have a room, several uh, people gather together here indoors. This could be a home or a restaurant one of whom is infected, <clears throat> and many coronavirus uh, outbreaks happen like this. So yeah, it's 12 o'clock, they're getting together, one person's infected. Four hours later, irrespective of the distances, okay, this safe distance of, of 1.5 meters, irrespective of the distances, if these people are in there for four hours with no windows and not wearing masks, everyone becomes infected, simply because of this aerosol that uh, you saw in this image on the left here, just fills the room. So that distance, uh, which is, was mentioned by the World Health Organization, becomes irrelevant under those circumstances. Mask use will reduce the risk somewhat. So now we have about a 25% reduction in risk if you wear a mask. But if the windows are closed, other people will still get infected. You're still getting 75% of people infected. The moment you open the windows or increase the ventilation, the infection risk drops way down to only perhaps one out of that room who will be infected. That's the key, is the ventilation. So wrapping up, the World Health Organization and the CDC have now finally acknowledged that aerosol, and let's use this word airborne, spread is the dominant route of transmission. And this is essentially what people like Lindsay Ma have been telling us since the beginning of the pandemic. Uh, so the implications, important ones, these two. The main focus of the controls must shift from this hand-washing, surface sanitizing obsession not, we mustn't abandon it, but we must just shift the focus to managing the air we breathe. And that's perhaps the important thing about today. And the second shift is the way we communicate. 
uh, in all our messaging, we must get people to embrace the importance of ventilation. Absolutely, wash hands, surface sanitize, but uh, you really get uh, in, uh, uh, your people in your building to understand the importance of ventilation, opening windows, or making sure that the HVAC systems are delivering enough fresh air. That's me, over. Uh, you still on mute, John? Sorry, <clears throat> thanks for that. Yes, uh, very interesting. I think it ties up with the information we got from the restaurant in Guazhangu in China, however you pronounce it, uh, January, February last year, where those where the first incidence uh, was uh, picked up. Um, and it indicated that air conditioning was involved uh, in the spread of the um, of, of that virus. Um, I think you've set the scene and set um, the um, need for uh, air conditioning and ventilation. Never mind the air conditioning, let's talk ventilation. Uh, Sean, does that uh, bring you in? Um, if you can uh, take us through for 50, 15 minutes, or is that uh, gone? It's gone now, yes. <laughs> That's gone, sir. Um, is it gone? Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Right. Can you hear me fine? I can hear you. Yes, Garth, we can okay, hear you. Okay, perfect. Yes. Sorry, so I the question, you. luckily Sean gave it to us. Right, Garth. So if you okay, give us cool. um, 15 minutes and then we'll go on to Sean. That's great. Lovely picture of the of the bird. Great. Oh, thanks so much. Um, right, so the question is, do you have ventilation? And that's what I want to speak to. So uh, Greg spoke about then the the importance of ventilation and he spoke about uh, to some extent about each one of these and this is really about a basket of barriers and not you'll see that not all barriers are equal but it's really we speak about in incident prevention about the james james reason swiss cheese model and if you want to see why anything uh, any incident ever happens you look at these individual barriers and you find in almost every incidence in fact incident investigation is really the investigation to what are the barriers and how they failed? So masks uh, over here, you'll see that masks typically actually prevent around five to 10% of actually transmissions, depending on which papers you look at. Um, You're not on the screen yet. I am, am I not on the screen yet? In terms of, is it not sharing? Yeah, presentation not on the screen. No, it's not on the screen yet. Okay, my apologies. I thought it was. Okay, can you see my screen now? Yes, we can. My apologies, okay, guys. That's perfect. All right. That was my son when he was younger. They was cuter when they're young. He's about 15 now. So you try sometimes forget that. Um, so he has your basket of barriers, your, your mask, social distancing, hand washing, disinfecting, uh, and, and ventilation. Uh, ventilation. So what happens is when you have each one of these barriers are not in place or they're actually defective in some way, that's when you actually then have actually then uh, infection in this particular case with actually COVID-19. Uh, this works for any investigation really. So not all barriers are equal and Greg spoke about this, is that if you take your PPE, your personal protective equipment, and even your uh, actually hand washing is, is in some, some respects kind of belongs in PPE administrative control in that you're relying on the behaviors of people. Uh, they fairly weak barriers. Engineering is the one where this is the main one we actually focus on is over here. And but the point is that in terms of being effective, the most effective is then can you do, do away with it? And that really is uh, what elimination is or keeping yourself totally separate. But we can't uh, work or live actually at home indefinitely. Uh, certainly not in lockdown, which is what elimination would do. Uh, and so then substitution it's not typically applicable here. Engineering is actually then the one we look at. And ventilation is actually at the engineering. If you look at the effective risk reduction, what does risk, if relative risk reduction mean? It means the, the amount of transmissions that then, that putting this intervention in place will actually then uh, reduce by. So for example, face coverings, uh, that's your isolation devices, your face masks, your fabric masks, typically prevent between five to 10% 
of HE transmissions. And you can then see over here, an air change per hour, you see we speak of different ventilation rates, but one thumb suck rule of thumb measure is the air change per hour. What an air change per hour is, one air change per hour means to take all of the air within the room, I take it and exchange it for outdoor air in terms of the total volume of that, that room. And that would be, if that happens once in an hour, that's one air change per hour. And you can then see the, the relative risk reduction provided by increasing ventilation. And you can then see why actually not all barriers are equal. Let's go on to ventilation. And the question, the, the question of this or the title was, do you have ventilation? Ventilation is not air conditioning. Uh, my boss, uh, Dorcas Mokojo, she also then says, repetition brings clarity, and I think it does. Ventilation, air conditioning is not ventilation. So if you have air conditioning, it is not the same as ventilation. Ventilation means that you take then the, the indoor air, you move it out, you take outdoor air, you move it in. Unless you're doing that, you really don't have ventilation. So the, the definition of ventilation in EN uh, one, two, 792 is the design, supply, and removal of air to and from a treated space. This is the air conditioning system. You have an outdoor condenser, an indoor evaporator. You have cooling that takes place between it. But theoretically, you can get units which then exchange air that you actually then get ventilation. But I've looked in, into detail. I've never found actually one in practice that actually exists in South Africa. Certainly, I work, I'm the group hygienist for NGN. That's why I see NGN, NGN up top here. Um, ex group uh, exposure scientist. And across the whole of NGN, which is sort of 20,000 people, uh, plus minus, uh, I've never come across actually a, a ventilator or an air conditioning system of this type that actually provides ventilation. What are different types of ventilation? So we get natural ventilation. Uh, and this is important is that when we speak about uh, ventilation, natural ventilation, this is opening up the windows. The problem with opening up the with natural ventilation is that it's so changeable. It depends on the day, depends on whether there's a high uh, pressure, a low pressure front or a high pressure front, or there's actually then what the wind is doing, which side the wind is actually coming from. There's tremendous variability. And the ability of a, on a single-sided ventilation where you open up, up one window, the ability for air to come in and out at the same time is very, very limited. Even if you have two windows in that, in that building on the same side, it's very limited opportunity for ventilation. The main one we use is actually what we call cross ventilation. So if you have a window on one side of the building and you have a window on the other side of the building, you'll find that that can offer ventilation. The problem with natural ventilation is that depends on which day you, you, you open the windows as to how much ventilation you're going to get. And really the only way to actually guarantee uh, a certain amount of ventilation is to use a mechanical fan system. So, and, and that's the problem with uh, ventilation is that if you measure it and you'll see that Sean will speak about CO2, a carbon dioxide, you'll find that it goes up and down quite significantly uh, across the day with actual natural ventilation. Importantly, if you have closed windows, you don't have ventilation. And I think one of the problems is that in SANS 10 400, uh, part 0 2011, it specifies that you have after 5% of actually then the, the floor area of the building, you have to have an up and openable window space. But of course, and that meets the, the SANS requirement, but if those windows are closed, you have got zero ventilation. Uh, of, unfortunately, SANS doesn't make it clear that you have to have the windows open in order to actually have compliance, but it is inferred. But of course, nobody wants to have your air conditioning system on and your windows open at the same time. Uh, so effectively, in most, and this is the big problem, is that you have these air conditioning systems over here, and people have them with closed windows, effectively you've got no ventilation. What we're seeing in Gauteng at the moment is actually a runaway effect of actually people being cold, closing their windows, and actually what we call far field, ventil far field actually transmission, or far range transmission, which is defined by WHO as actually greater than one meter. Because everybody's windows are closed, you could air, there maybe the heat is on, you don't want, uh, want to get cold, which means no ventilation. 
This is a true ventilation system, but even with this type of ventilation system, you may not have then actually sufficient ventilation. For example, what does sufficient ventilation mean? Uh, Reva, which is then the European Air Conditioning Society, they define actually 100% relative risk. What 100% relative risk means is that your likelihood, theoretically in the model, of you contracting uh, COVID-19, if there was an index, an infected person in that space, would be 100% if you had less than two liters per second per person. So if you take the number of occupants within that building and you got five, uh, even at let's say 10, 10 liters per second for those group of people, you would have 100% relative risk. So you still wouldn't have sufficient ventilation to actually prevent actually then uh, COVID-19. So the, the things we look at when you talk about, you got sufficient concentration, you got sufficient duration, and you then got actually then uh, some activity like talking, whatever, that's when actually the problems occur. An HVAC system, heating, ventilation, the V stands for ventilation means outdoor air and air conditioning. So what you have is that you have actually outdoor air coming in and the, the return air uh, goes through the system and you have a certain amount of makeup air. Uh, and that is a true ventilation system. Of course, you, the question uh, is then what rates of ventilation are you achieving? Are you achieving sufficient ventilation to prevent actually transmission? This is a mechanical let's ventilation that, system. Let's make that five minutes then, God. Sure. So you. if you've got a mechanical ventilation system, you've got supply, but you don't have actually return, return air. This system is also fairly common, not as, not as common actually as the HVAC system, but it means that you, you push it through. Of course, you have to have thought very carefully around where the air goes out of the building. And again, you, you need some expertise to actually then to put in this type of system and we see so many badly designed systems. So what are adequate ventilation rates? So SANS 10400, which I spoke about, is that it says that you've got to have, let's work with this, 7.5 liters per second uh, for classrooms. And we're talking far lower than actually in, in open plan offices. But the point is that these are comfort-based standards, not for prevention of COVID-19, not for pre prevention of flu either. The WHO, the World Health Organization, they specify the minimum ventilation rate at 10 liters per second per person. And another point is, is that because of the occupancy of a, a classroom or meeting room, and also the activity that takes place there, people are speaking, you need double amount the, the amount of fresh air ventilation in meeting rooms mm. than actually in offices. All right. We need short-term ventilation uh, in, to actually prevent transmission of COVID. But importantly, it's life has changed. We talk about the new normal, but there's also going to be a new normal going forward. So we need short-term interventions. And if we'd had more time, we could have spoken about short-term interventions, typically fans measuring CO2, and Sean will cover that. But we also need a longer-term view. In terms of South Africa, we actually, the Sub-Saharan -Sub Africa uh, has got the highest death rates for actually influenza in the world. It costs South Africa about annually, about 270 million, and absenteeism in South Africa alone of about 3 million man days, actually person days per year. So the question is, why don't we want to prevent that? And we should, and we need to. Then there's also then, um, then there's also another thing which is actually CO2. Now, if we care about then, even if you don't care about health, you say, well, back of the health, you are paying for people and people are expensive. They're the most expensive resource actually in a business. Or, and if you look at then what CO2, so this is actually good, good uh, at low CO2, which means that there's, it's very good ventilation, medium ventilation, very poor ventilation, this. And if you then have, what this is showing that if you then on basic activity, if you got raised CO2, which are these red, dot, red dots over here, is your score is actually then decreased. If you then look at your initiative, if you take then to see what raised CO2, which means typically if you're all feeling sleepy in a room, uh, it's been a meeting room, it's raised CO2. So that's why you feel like taking a break because your initiative scores are pretty much through the, through the floor. 
if you look at strategy, what CO2 and strategy does, raise CO2, you can see, see how people actually scored strategically. So what I'm saying is this, if you want a good performing business, you want the people you've paid for to do well, uh, actually go and actually get good ventilation. If you want to make sure that you, you decrease the mandates just purely on uh, influenza alone, you need actually good ventilation. So what I'm saying is that SANS 10400 needs to change from a comfort-based strategy to a health-based strategy. And that health-based strategy would deliver on actually performance, it'll deliver on actually mandates, and actually then in the short term, actually COVID as well. Thank you, John. Thank you very much, uh, Garth. So what we're driving to now with SAFMA is improving the productivity of our staff, not cut necessarily just cutting costs. And this leads us on to Sean, Mr. Sean Chester, who's the CEO of Green Flag, who's going to take this now um, and provide, we, we, we've, we've posed the problem, we've set the scenario. Now let's look at uh, where some of the solutions sit. So Sean, that's, uh, that's the lead in for you. You, <clears throat> um, you just need to share the screen, take this off. Thank you very much, John. We've still got God, would you just stop sharing if you don't mind? Yeah, God's still sharing. There we yes. go. You're, we've got you. All right. So just my little inserts over here. Remember, this is a very compressed uh, uh, yeah, version of, of what we what we're about. And uh, yeah, it would take it would take up to a week to train the inspectors that we have trained to, to teach you sort of the ins and outs of, of how we go about things. So I'm just here to tell you a little bit about Green Flag the association itself as well as about the use of carbon dioxide as a rapid testing tool to test ventilation rates. Okay, so we understand we've already said there's been this lack of clear communication about uh, that, that this disease is truly airborne and uh, that's actually started right from last year sort of May, June when the world scientific community almost basically uh, comprehensively agreed that it's an airborne disease, but the World Health Organization, the CDC, who basically uh, help inform government policies all around the world, have been very slow to ad adopt it, and uh, they've 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 now finally done it. It's been about a month or so. So, yeah, we've been ahead of, ahead of the game right through the, right through from the beginning, and we've been pushing this through different platforms and different uh, scenarios uh, and all over the place. So there's overwhelming evidence that trapped exhaled air is the main source of super spreader incidents. And we've seen the, the, the graphs and that that Garth and Greg have put together. And there's been this critical failure. The reason why Gauteng is blowing up at the moment and how why India blew up, not only just because it's the Delta variant, but it's because it's actually the Delta variant operating in, in, in enclosed spaces in, in the way that it does. So you're getting, if you've got so, uh, three infected people getting into say a taxi, for example, and they're taking a half an hour trip, they could actually, ultimately infects all 16 people inside that taxi as we go. So we can see it's actually becoming very, very critical that we attach us and these variants are certainly getting a lot more uh, sort of dangerous and infectious, infectious I'd say, which is increased danger. So the Green Flag Association is a world first and it's proudly South African. Uh, it really started getting put together on the 4th of October last year and it's just been, it's been a roller coaster ride so far. It's a multidisciplinary uh, um, association. It's got people like Greg and Garth and myself and, and other scientists. Uh, we, we've got an, an infectious diseases specialist from, from uh, Washington State University and we've got professors and doctors from all around in different disciplines and that's really important because we've been operating in silos uh, if you look at the news and you look at the way the policies have been set, even in South Africa, you can see this very siloed approach. It's like, let's put the vaccine on and then kind of everything kind of goes out the wind at the same time as well. You actually need this integrated approach across um, professional platforms. And it's aimed at reducing the transmission of COVID-19 and other airborne pathogens. Remember, Dr. Greg said uh, tuberculosis and measles, influenza, all of those are actually spread in very similar ways. So we believe that at the Green Flag Associated Ventilation is the solution to everything. And uh, yeah, this is how we're going. So we operate collaboratively, collaboratively to provide practical solutions where the tire hits the road. And Gar spoke about just the use of fans in the short term. I mean, we've done lots of experiments on, on how useful a fan is if it's installed into a window, how rapidly it can actually uh, change the, the air within that area. 
And we've obviously we've been very active on all media platforms. I mean, we've been on the news, SA, SABC, Pan ENCA. We've been in most of the newspapers. So you know, we, we've got a lot of traction already. We've also got a lot of street pole ads. If we drive around, look for the green flag uh, street pole ads. You'll find them all over the country. So what about this idea of, of carbon dioxide? Now we, we both mentioned it briefly, and you know it's just great. It's gaining so much uh, sort of traction as the, as the best way to rapidly assess um, an environment and the ventilation rates. Uh, we know that exhaled airs would actually add carbon dioxide to the, the, the background or the ambient concentration. So outside it might be 400 parts per million, and obviously as you add to that, you you are then getting this. This component of rebreathe there, rebreathe there is by implication is actually breathed out. It's got viral particles in it. Back in the day, uh, the coal miners used to use the canaries, then it's the same canary in the coal mine. Today, we've got an instrument that does it for us and it can actually very accurately measure in real time the carbon dioxide concentrations uh, as we go. So, yeah, this is the new way of actually testing things, and it's, it's, it really is um, uh, through direct reading equipment. So, these limits that we apply to, to, to um, ventilation rates, they are based on science, they're based on engineering, based on aerosol science as well. And there's kind of consensus, uh, emerging consensus, that your concentration of around 800 parts per million would give you about a 90.9.9% risk reduction um, of far field spread. You know, if, if you're still sitting shoulder to shoulder with somebody and they're infected, that is not gonna help you. No amount of ventilation will kind of help you really. But, what if, but you, if somebody's at another table, say in a restaurant or in a workplace, and you've got good ventilation and you're, uh, and you're maintaining a relatively good distance, you will not become infected. You'd have a 99.9% sort of chance of not becoming uh, infected. So what we use is we actually take it and we, use it, we do uh, two tests. We do a rapid test, which is actually using the, the piece of the equipment itself. And if, it, if it's below 800 parts per million, then we know we're actually looking at really good ventilation. Then obviously, as it progresses above 800 parts per million, you start getting these uh, sort of decreasing um, uh, vent air quality standards. And then at 1,400 parts per million, we can actually say it's, we can, we can pretty much say it's low quality ventilation. Now, this is important because around about those 1,400 parts per million, which is very, very typical in indoor environments. So if you go into your boardrooms and you see those split unit air conditioners that Garth was talking about, you will guaranteed, studies have shown, there will be de de decreased decision making, decreased concentration, uh, decreased strategic thinking as well. And yeah, you can't sniff uh, carbon dioxide, it's completely colorless and odorless. Your body doesn't uh, detect it at all. It doesn't, you don't get increased re respiration at all or anything like that. So the only way to tell what the concentrations are is actually by the use of an instrument. So what does, what, what, what do you, what, how does Green Flag do it? Yes, we this organization of, of experts, multidisciplinary experts, but there's also another tier to it, which is actually the, 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 the base tier. And that tier is the ones that actually come out into your environments, into the facilities that you manage. And actually, can, we can use these rap, rapid assessment techniques. But we also do a full risk assessment. We look at the protocols that you've got. Do you have hand sanitizers? Is there distancing? Do you have de-densification policies? Um, and those sorts of things. What are your occupancy rates? Uh, do you have static and trans, uh, transient uh, occupancy? Like in a boardroom, it'd be pretty transient. You'd have a mix of different people coming from different parts of the workplaces or visitors from outside versus people that have come to the same office and sit in the same office every day and socialize uh, within that office um, or even by themselves. Obviously your activity and your vocalization, the higher the activity at gym would certainly uh, be emitting a much more higher viral load and CO2 uh, subsequently. The vocalization activity within your, your, your place as well. Again, let's use the boardroom example. The higher the vocalization, the more shouting that's going on, the, 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 certainly the more aerosols and the more CO2. So we'll do a manual test for the CO2, but we also may, if we've got a little bit of vaginus, especially when you've got highly transient environments, we may recommend the, the temporary placements of a continuous uh, carbon dioxide monitor device just to actually track it over weeks. Uh, and we'd like to actually have it over an entire month and get that data. If, 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 your, if the workplace seems to be that it's set up well, what we would do is actually issue you a compliance certificate that your, your environment is set up and you can see there's a certificate for the butcher boys. It's one of the restaurants that we've, that we've done locally. And uh, that's got a QR code on it. If you scan that QR code, it'll actually take you to the, the, the ventilation uh, caveats and the, the certificates itself. So you might find that you could get a green flag uh, 
certification only if all windows are open all the time, or if occupancy does not exceed 20 people, or if there's a, a, an extractor fan or a supply fan installed, or if we have to introduce through flow ventilation, or you have a purge period. And there's lots of different types of caveats that you can have that actually still, that will not rule out the fact that you can get green flag. Obviously, if, you, if, 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 the, if, it, it's a, if it's a complete fail, then we would like to work with you and give you the kind of advice that you need as a facility manager, facility owner, to, to, to be able to implement this as well as, and, and get it going. Then we also come back on a monthly basis as well, and we come and recheck the environment. Obviously, if there's a, a lot of change and a lot of variability within the, the, the foot traffic, then we would be we have to do it every month. But if it's very static and it's quite consistently uh, reproducible and the ventilation system says a full mechanical HVAC system, then we can actually say we'll come in and check every six months. But we'll also come check whether there's the continuous monitoring device because one of the ways that you do get the certification is based on is that you will also have a continuous monitoring device installed at all times in as many places as is necessary. So boardrooms typically would have one. Uh, open plan office typically would have one. Um, this is just a, a rapid test result. What we get is we actually download the data off it. This is, this is in a taxi, and you can see quite clearly that uh, walking into a taxi, no problem, getting in the taxi, all the windows closed with 16 people, and you very, very quickly to get to the spike of 3,000. We've measured over 5,000 uh, parts per million inside a taxi, open the windows, and the, the, the carbon dioxide concentrations plummet. So you can really visually see how important uh, the, the adjustment how, uh, and how dynamic, dynamically you can actually interpret and adjust your, your ventilation within a, uh, within a setting. This is the platform that you would have with your continuous monitoring device. What would happen is that either the facility manager or whoever actually gets given the permissions by, based on the, 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 the agreement between the Green Flag Association and the, and, and the business, you would actually have access to this console. So it could be your safety officer, your she rep, your, your COVID-19 officer, your doctor, whatever it is, they would all be able to log in and actually check it. These things as well, as soon as you get spikes, we'll, we'll, we can set uh, the limits. And if you get spikes above those limits, we can uh, you get an SMS or, uh, or an email, whichever your preferred way of communication is. And it actually monitors it real time, all the time, 24-7, 365. Um, and we are in the process of busy working at maybe a control center, similar to Tracker, where we could actually phone uh, somebody if it's, if it's that sort of environment. Um, uh, and we could actually then liaise with those people directly. So conferences and those sorts of uh, event type things really become very uh, important at that time. So I just want to end with this statement. You know, uh, we understand that, you know, it's necessary for triumph of evil is <laughs> The only thing, nothing, nothing, anything necessary for the triumph of evil is for good men to do nothing. And we are, we, we sitting here, we've got areas of responsibility, we've got areas of, of, uh, uh, of influence, and we need to use those areas of influence, whether it's with our families, whether, whether it's our workplaces, and our sub subordinates, and our colleagues, and our bosses. We need to get stuck in, and we need to work together. And I think, Safma, uh, thank you very much for this opportunity to, to present to your, to your, your guys' association members. Thank you very much. Sean, uh, thank you very much. Uh, <clears throat> that's great. <coughs> um, what we can say that uh, SAFMA is fully aligned with the uh, green flag. One of the questions we've had, beat, um, beat Robert to the draw here, um, <clears throat> is that um, is green flag available for um, office buildings? And I think the answer is yes. How do you get hold of green flag? The answer will be through the SAFMA website. You'll find the link on the SAFMA website and that will link you through to Green Flag. So that um, we, uh, SAFMA is uh, supportive, <coughs> excuse me, of, uh, of the Green Flag Association. So I think that um, we've got a question um, which has been interesting is does, does HVAC transport the virus to other areas? Um, and if yes, uh, let's crash a couple of questions. What are the filtration requirements and also does UV in the HVAC system assist? So I think the concern is here, you've got centralized air conditioning, you're pulling the air out of spaces. Um, are we contributing to the, um, the spread of the virus uh, into other areas? Uh, Sean, I don't know whether you want to have a go at that or Robert. Uh, oh, thank you. 
Okay. Sorry, are you, uh, Sean, uh, must I handle this one? No, uh, uh, well, I think you asked me, um, Sampia. Oh, sorry. In terms of then, um, actually an HVAC system, there's excellent, there's so many super spreading events that have happened and we've got really good data to show then how transmissions actually occurred. If you look at then, uh, I was actually presenting this morning on actually a Korean, uh, I think about a Korean multi-story building, probably at least I think about 14 uh, stories. And in that particular case, actually, I think 197 round about there, people on a single floor, it was probably around 30 meter long floor, but let's say 15, 20 meters, 197 people actually within that space actually then became infected. But across the other floors of the building, so even though there was very poor ventilation clearly within that floor, between the other floors, only three people in the rest of the building actually became infected. And actually there's, there's numerous other cases that actually show this. So typically we, we think then that the main risk actually lies within a single shared airspace and that there's not significant then, that significant risk actually then between floors, even if there is inadequate ventilation provided by that HVAC system. In terms of then, uh, the main message at the moment we've got is increased ventilation. Uh, they, they, you can actually then do other things like increasing actually then the, the filters or the efficacy of the grade of the filters, but there's, that needs to be done very carefully and certainly shouldn't be your first go-to. In terms of uh, there's problems, you create actually pressure problems and other issues sometimes by doing that. And then also then in terms of uh, the UVC, there's different types of UVC, but certainly there's com some complexity to that. And it should be carefully thought through uh, as to whether you use UVC, it's certainly not a straightforward decision. What is straightforward is that ventilate. Ventilate, and that should be your first go-to. The, the question, of course, is for, to have somebody uh, come and actually have a look at your system and determine then what ventilation rate you can actually achieve with your system. Typically, you can achieve between a 10 to 20% increase in fan rates, and you could also then actually cut down the amount of recirculation of that uh, system, sometimes to zero, depending on the system. But certainly, you need to have somebody assess the system who understands actually the, the system. It's also that you need to, when getting a, a ventilation person, make sure that that person understands what you're going to achieve. If you actually assessing ventilation for comfort, uh, that's not the same as assessing a system to actually prevent actually transmission of actually uh, COVID-19. Uh, so there's some steps to follow to make sure that you, you get led along the right path and you take the right interventions. Thanks, John. All right, thank you, I think. <clears throat> um, another one from Renee at uh, one of the schools and certainly um, I've got family teaching at school. So we, at, at the schools, where obviously um, forced ventilation might be limited other than specific areas, uh, what are your recommendations um, are for the classrooms? So over here, the best way to do is to get some form of mechanical ventilation. And Sean and I did actually some testing at the, the offices, Apex Environmental. And what we saw is that by putting a, a fixed fan in the window and extracting, you can actually pull, effectively actually then pull air across that, across that building and actually deliver ventilation. One of the other things we saw is though that there was quite good laminar flow across the, across the building, but there wasn't that great mixing actually at the edges of actually then the, 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 the room. So if you really wanted good ventilation, you'd put then, and it doesn't have to be noisy and it doesn't have to be actually at the highest volume. You don't have to have a hurricane blowing through, but you should have then actually, let's say extractor fans, you can actually put them actually on this in, within the window spaces, open up the windows on the other side. And you depending on the size of the building, have two, three of those across then the, the one side of the building at different uh, spaces between them. And you can effectively actually ventilate the building. That's a short-term intervention. You should also then look to, to actually longer-term interventions, which is then upgrading actually the HVAC system. But that's a much more, uh, and again, before you spend money and put capital into that, you want to know that you, you're you being guided and developing and actually does designing the correct system, which are going to, going to actually then help or to achieve the aim you want to, 
which is to actually reduce actually uh, the spread of actually hazardous biological agents. Because if you can't, again, use a comfort-based standard and you go and design and put a system in, but that system is incorrectly designed, it's going to be regret capital. So, Robert, you got your hand up there. <clears throat> uh, Rob? Yeah, thanks. Thanks, John. Sorry, I was muted there. Yeah, it, it, coming back to the, the HVAC uh, transmission of the virus, when you're looking at those sort of systems, you need to be careful. And I'll follow on from what Garth was saying. If you increase the ventilation in that system, that's great because you bring in more outside air, but merely increasing the velocity of the existing system can run into a problem because if you're not filtering the air through MERV 13 filters or similar, you, you can, and I've seen the research, you can transport the virus from one office into another office. So again, just, just be wary of that. Uh, in terms of classrooms, yes, um, using fans, probably the cheapest route uh, blowing blowing air out, keep doors and windows open, and then every now and then, you know, when the students walk out and then come back in. But the best way is to to probably have a keep keep your eye on on the carbon dioxide levels um, um, and and see what's happening with them in that classroom during the lessons. You do get classrooms that are very similar to offices where they have um, air conditioning, um, and that's it. Uh, you need to be very careful of that because even though the air feels nice and cool and fresh. It, it's, it's probably not. So you would have to open doors and windows, which becomes a problem, um, particularly in winter. Uh, you know, it will be, will be cold, but at least try and open it to a certain extent. It, there will be a bit of compromise in, in comfort with when it comes to the, the, the health and safety of, of the, the pupils. Thanks, John. <clears throat> All right. Um, I think the um, what we're looking at as well is the CO2 is an indicator of um, of the level of fresh air, which is then the an indicator um, as to the level of of problems we might have in a space. Um, so the question then I think is um, in the in the last few minutes, Sean, how would we how would you <clears throat> as a green flag then carry out a a survey of a building um, from, you know, obviously someone's going to phone you up and contact you and then take you in. What, what are you going to look for and how are you going to certify that? Okay, just before I answer that completely, John, I just think it'd be quite useful to know that I've been doing indoor air quality assessments for 30 years. I'm an exposure scientist, just like Robert and, and like God. And ventilation for the last 30 years has always been problematic and sick building syndrome exists because of the um, the oil crisis uh, in, the, in the early 70s and in the 80s sick building syndrome became a buzzword but to solve every single sick building syndrome issue pretty much is ventilation and that's what it's always shown so COVID has just really compressed this idea of actually the necessity and the absolute possibility of avoidance of, of that so the way what we do it is if somebody contacts the Green Flag Association and they want us to come out and, and, and meet with them, certainly the, the more complicated the building, the higher the level of expertise that needs to be interacted with. Um, so we would then organize a meeting and we'd come around and have a discussion. We look at the scope of the, of the problem uh, or the scope of the, of the facility. And then we would do a walk around and we'll book the inspection, do a walk around and actually measure the the, 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 the the building itself, um, in terms of occupancy, obviously you want full occupancy or as close to full occupancy as occupancy as, occupancy as as you can, so we can actually project what those concentrations are, and we, we can fully understand the extent of the issue. We'd also then inspect the ventilation systems as well. We look at the, the, the air handling units. We see what the what the fresh air capability is of those and check them. And then after that, we would, if there's any problems, we will sit down and consult. And, uh, and, and resolve those issues. And there might be some caveats, you know, you might actually have to require some de-densification. I mean, I, I'm probably part of an office as well. And that office has got 35 people in it. And we busy in the process of now de-densifying again, uh, identifying a vulnerable people, sending them over, work can be done at home, must be done at home, and those sorts of things. So it's a, it's a 360 thing. And then obviously the, 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 the big component is for, if it's a public space and there's high variability, and certainly if there's natural ventilation like a classroom um, or a, a, a place where there's a, 
uh, say you've got a split unit air conditioner, but you do have a window that opens, you need to have that carbon dioxide concentrate, uh, concentration monitored dynamically so that you can actually risk assess on a dynamic basis. And that's pretty much it. And then after, when we finished, we will issue the, 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 the certificates. The certificate, again, is actually a platform-based certificate as well. It's got a QR code on it. And anybody can just scan that certificate um, on the QR code and they can actually see what the caveats are as well as the, um, the validity of the certificate. If the certificate expires, that immediately does not actually report up through the QR code. And so then the certificate is then seen to have been withdrawn. So just a quick one to add to that. Uh, is there CO2 measurement uh, built into BMS systems that you know? Standard. The, the building, standard, ma the building uh, management systems yeah, that so exist. Talking, so they're busy working on it. Um, as, uh, we, we've been told that uh, Toby von Rennen, who works for the CSI, is the, the chief uh, yeah. mechanical no, engineer. Him. Okay, he's busy working on parts of the national building regulations, and they, they're going to be including carbon dioxide uh, in it. It, and I think that will be, I, I'm not sure when they get published, these things work slowly through the technical committees. But if you look at how they're actually adopting things, uh, I think it's, uh, was it Belgium have, have now officially said that all public spaces need to be monitored by carbon dioxide. And this, it's just gaining such traction. It just makes such, relative to your cost, your reward is just significant, you know. Um, and when you start talking about absenteeism, productivity, thinking, better decision making, there's lots and lots of studies that actually support the use of these types of direct reading pieces of equipment on a continuous basis to, uh, to monitor dynamically the risk of everything. What's it? Is, the, is it the risk of, of falling asleep in a meeting? Yes, let's monitor that. It's the same thing, you know? Is it the risk of, is it the risk of actually having good decision making inside a boardroom where all the CEOs and the executive committees are sitting and making these decisions? Yes. Keep your CO2 below 800 and you're going to make good decisions, better decisions at least. Um, what about in taxis? I mean, we, these drivers are, are working with people and they are driving uh, kilometers, uh, sometimes two or three hours, and they're sitting at 10,000 parts per million inside a closed environment. What's that doing to our safety? What's that doing? We know how the taxis are. We know what about when you're driving from Joburg to Durban on holiday with your family and you don't have your, you have your, your car on recirculation mode and not fresh air mode? What are your concentrations of carbon dioxide? I can tell you now, they're over 5,000 parts per million inside their vehicle because I've tested them. So it's an important factor, yes. Sean, thank you very much. Uh, we've got, got coming to the end of the time. Um, <clears throat> to Dr. Greg um, Q, thank you for your time and insights and Garth Hunter and uh, Robert to take him out of the mountains. Sorry about that, Robert. Uh, and to Sean, uh, I think this is a. I think this is the future. I think we've opened up a, a a discussion in an area that's difficult. No one ever said it's easy. It's difficult. It's potentially has potential to be expensive, and I think it's an area that uh, possibly in the past in facilities management has been um, left on the side a bit because it's difficult to to solve. And I think COVID has now uh, meant that uh, air quality in the, in the workplace, air quality in <clears throat> wherever we live, uh, in, the, in the restaurant shops is now critical. And um, we thank you very much for coming on board. So to everyone, <clears throat> um, Green Flag Association is available, <clears throat> is available through SAFMA. Uh, we, we, we're glad to be able to be associated with Green Flag. And certainly, um, as uh, putting, looking at improving the workplace environment, uh, certainly I think that this is uh, the way forward. So on that, thank you very much, team. Uh, thank you very much to everyone who joined in with us. Uh, thanks to Morion for setting it up. And, um, and we look forward, everyone stay safe, and we look forward to having this discussion and taking it forward. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, John. Thank you. Cheers, everyone.